Hello everyone, thank you for tuning in. Kaylin here. I just want to say thank you for everyone who watched my last video on James Baldwin. I think last time I checked, I got somewhere around 300 subscribers, more than 900 likes, and several well-written comments. I love the engagement, and I just want to say thank you for everyone who is participating and making this channel exceptional. Today's video essay is going to be on the world-renowned psychologist, clinical psychologist, Jordan Peterson. If you're not aware, he's really become known for being a champion for men coming to terms with their manhood, just a, a stand-up person for sanity in the world. He's a harsh critic of the totalitarian left or the authoritarian left. Um, he talks a lot about Nazis, World War II, and how if we're not careful, we will slip back into an archaic and dark period of humanity. He's been criticized for being far right wing and for being dismissive of trans rights, gay rights, women's rights. And I don't think it's as simple as saying he doesn't care about those things. I think we have to give space for conversation to really understand what it is that he's saying. In this video essay, I'm going to be giving my diagnosis, if you will, of his book, 12 Rules for Life, which I read in its entirety and found to be very enlightening. I'm also going to give uh, my critiques of the book and why I think it needs to be more fleshed out in terms of speaking about indigenous cultures and the contributions that other members of the global society have made to mankind. You can find the basic version of this essay on my Substack and my Medium page. I did add in more content to flesh out this essay to give more perspective and nuance on the ideas that I'm going to be putting forth. Let's jump right into it. Jordan Peterson, Sage or Madman? This essay serves to shine a spotlight on the noted and now famed clinical psychologist, Jordan Peterson. I discuss why I think his book, 12 Rules for Life, is an honorable piece of literature and how I find it to be usable for those seeking to improve their lives. I also discuss why I feel that Mr. Peterson is much more of a Western apologist than one might wish him to be considering the grave and destructive history of Western culture and its disastrous effects on the larger world. Jordan Peterson's book, 12 Rules for Life, made its way into my life three days after Christmas, 2022. I took my time with this assiduous work because, well, you have to. In order to digest the wisdom, the insight, the distinctive candor responsible for the theater that is Jordan's imagination, to borrow one of his phrases, one has to walk slowly with him through the garden of his mind. I did this and can say for certain that I'm better for it. This review, if that's what you want to call it, is not going to be like others. By that, I mean... I'm not going to do a step-by-step -step breakdown of each rule and what I think about them. Instead, I'm going to let my spirit speak. I want to say first that as Jordan Peterson began to make a name for himself as a stalwart of fresh thought within the public sphere a few years back, circa 2017, I was impressed first by his energy. When he spoke, he demanded that you listen. The diction, the vocabulary, and the knowledge he possessed culminated into a persona of sheer charismatic force, such that one could not casually take him in. You know, not everybody is equipped to or interested in engaging in high-level discussion of abstract and creative ideas. You know, you hear this idea that everyone's creative. That's a lie. It's as straightforward as that. True creativity is very, very rare. And so, and if you happen to be a creative person, or if you happen to be someone who's profoundly interested in ideas, you are in a pronounced minority, just as you are if you happen to be extremely extroverted or extremely agreeable or extremely conscientious. These are minority issues and what you do is you find like-minded people who are capable of engaging that. We know heavyweight, heavyweight weightlifters compete with heavyweight weightlifters. He required your full attention and mental engagement. I next found rather inspirational his ability to articulate himself on topics I've pondered and discussed with my own friends over the years. A few of my friends and I regularly wax philosophical on everything from the prospect of God and a broken humanity to the subtleties of great acting and global affairs. Our conversations are comical, emotional, serious, energetic, thoughtful, and above all, nuanced. Jordan's take on many of the topics I've been thinking about since I began studying the theorized political utility of anarchism in my 20s expanded the playing field within my own mind such that I could now consider new perspectives on old problems. Such a forced expansion of thought is golden. Often we think we've arrived at answers to dilemmas we've considered and then someone comes along and challenges our resolutions or adds new information to our existing paradigms. Now, our paradigms can shift. 
If you're lucky and ready for it, your worldview may even shatter. This is what makes Jordan such a valuable member of global society. The first article I ever wrote on him represented my very myopic and dare I say unsophisticated leftist view of his thinking and philosophy. I pegged him as somewhat of a racist, pro-Eurocentric, anti-everything else, libertarian apologist, whose central theme was that if it weren't for the cultural and educational contributions of the West, i.e. European art, literature, etc., mankind would be in the doldrums of existence, chasing our own tails, much like our canine companions. And while I think he is still very much partial to Europe and the contributions that members of the European nations have made to global culture, I think this is only out of his desire to weave a helpful narrative of upliftment for mankind. Jordan Peterson has chosen to use his understanding and familiarity with the Judeo-Christian religious experience to map out a worldview of peace and harmony for human beings. His feeling is that, rooted in just about every religious tradition, central texts are the tenets of suffering and redemption. However, in his opinion, the Christian Bible is principal among them for its longevity and ability to speak to most domains of human existence. The Bible and its texts have been the subject of massive debate for centuries. In addition, those who have espoused its rhetoric as tenets to live by have not demonstrated the best examples of its dicta. Still, it makes sense that Peterson will gravitate towards Christian religious philosophy. As a white male who grew up in the West, he is Canadian, and studied history from the perspective of Western scholars, his worldview represents a model of human culture that has derived a majority of its virtues from Western influence. Fair enough. But we have to acknowledge that this perspective is extremely exclusionary. It's up to people of color to showcase the contributions of their own people, proffer a universal philosophy for the betterment of mankind, and then showcase this for the world to see. Fortunately, this has already been done, though Jordan Peterson and his ilk seem not to notice. African spiritualism, with its reliance upon nature gods and the balance of mankind with nature's forces, and Hinduism, specifically with reference to the Vedas, are examples of non-Western religious philosophies which seek to elevate all of humanity and have provided millions throughout human existence with viable and desirable pathways towards peace and liberation. In addition, the definitive and comprehensive scholastic research performed by historians like Dr. John Henry Clark and Dr. Yosef Ben Yochanan has brought to light the immense and pivotal intellectual offerings of Africans throughout the ages. Their work has shown that the foundation for much of modern man's medical knowledge and technological superiority were first demonstrated in Africa and the Middle East. The first person we have details about in history is a black man, M. Hotel. And M. Hotel was the world's first multi genius. He was a scientist, he was a priest. He was the world's first physician. He gathered the intellects of his day around him that became the embryo of what later would be the beginning of higher learning. In truth, we owe much of our cultural and social advancement to African people of the past. Peterson rarely acknowledges the historical contributions that Africans in particular have made to the long forward march of humanity. Example given, the pyramids, mathematics, medicine, and technological inventions. In terms of educational contributions, Peterson, at least publicly, has never discussed how Thales, Pythagoras, Aristotle, and Plato studied for years in Africa learning and refining their now popularized philosophies and ethics, which have become standard parts of almost every modern humanities curriculum. While he consistently references the horrific nature of the Jewish Holocaust, he generally fails to address the massive African Holocaust that was the African slave trade. From 1500 to 1880 CE, somewhere between 10 and 12 million African slaves were forcibly moved from Africa to the Americas, and about 15% of those people died during the journey. The majority of enslaved Africans were taken from six primary regions, Senegambia, Sierra Leone and the Windward Coast, the Gold Coast, the Bight of Benin, the Bight of Biafra, and West Central Africa, also known as Congo and Angola. An estimated 12.4 million people were loaded onto slave ships and carried through what became known as the Middle Passage. Unignorable atrocities have been committed by Europeans on indigenous people all over the world. Example given, Africans and Native American Indians, to name only two groups, dating back to Columbus. Although it should be common knowledge, many Western historians and scholars seem to gloss over the role Catholic Spain, Portugal, 
and subsequently Protestant Holland and Britain played in setting the stage for the underdevelopment of Africa through their wars over which countries would come to dominate the African slave trade. Peterson speaks very little of the raping, pillaging, and economic robbery of indigenous peoples the world over at the hands of Europeans, and when he does, as in his 2023 interview with Dr. Nigel Bigger, he tends to agree with Bigger that, all in all, European and Western culture have proffered a net good upon the uncivilized wretched of the earth. Sometimes you get Britons who are uh, dismissive and contemptuous of native cultures, but on the other hand, um, in India, for example, you have Britons who are fascinated by uh, ancient uh, Sanskrit uh, uh, Hindu culture, who, who uh, uh, unlike Indians who are allowing their ancient monuments to disintegrate, preserve the monuments. Uh, so, so um, yes, there was racism, but there was also uh, respect for and fascination for and admiration for native, uh, native cultures. Peterson is notorious by now for his use of Judeo-Christian lore as the foundation for his culturally exclusionary ideologies. This is no secret. His belief in the power of Judeo-Christian values to be the beacon of light for the savages of the world is apparent in his writings and teaching. So naturally, for Peterson, Europe's horrific brutalization and economic pipping of much of the world must necessarily be excused because, well, Europeans bought the barbarian cultures the miracle of Christian salvation. In an interview with American lawyer and conservative political commentator Ben Shapiro, Peterson even seems to assert that Africans in the U.S. were doomed to be slaves and that black Africans in general, as the descendants of Ham, were always destined to lives of extreme subjugation and suffering because they are the progeny of those who violated tradition. Tradition, in this sense, amounts to a euphemism for paternalism. And his son, Ham, comes along and has a pretty good laugh about how stupid his father is, which is a pretty damn ungrateful thing to do. And foolish, because Ham would be, it would be of great, it'd be a great accomplishment of Ham to be half the man that his father was. So anyways, he laughs at Noah and then he gets his brothers and he says, you know, hey, the old man's, you know, drunk out of his mind. Why don't we go? And, and he's all sprawled out. Let's go over there and we can all join in a good laugh. And his other sons, Noah's other sons, take a blanket and they back into the tent and they cover Noah. Okay. And so, they show him respect despite his flaws. Now, the way that story ends is that, in tradition, is that slaves are the descendants of Ham. And so the moral of the story is that if you're foolish enough to dispense with your wise traditions, because you can point to flaws that inherit to men better than you, far better than you, let's say Thomas Jefferson, for example, that you are walking a pathway that it will, will turn you and your descendants into the slaves of people who have proper respect for tradition. The sins of the fathers will be revisited on the progeny, Peterson seems to assert. For those that are unaware, Mormon religious lore has it that African skin is dark, not as a result of climate, but because black people are cursed descendants from the legacy of Ham and Canaan. It seems that this line of thinking originated in part from the Catholic nun and visionary mystic Anne Catherine Emmerich, who was purported by writers of her day, Clemens Brentano and William Wessener, to have said, I saw the curse pronounced by Noah upon Ham moving toward the latter like a black cloud and obscuring him. His skin lost its whiteness. He grew darker. His sin was the sin of sacrilege, the sin of one who would forcibly enter the Ark of the Covenant. I saw a most corrupt race descend from him and sink deeper and deeper in darkness. I see that the black, idolatrous, stupid nations are the descendants of Ham. Their color is due not to the rays of the sun, but to the dark source whence those degraded races sprang. So where do these crazy ideas come from? Well, in the Bible, Ham supposedly made fun of and mocked Noah, his father, for an episode of drunken nakedness. According to some biblical scholars, Ham also either committed sodomy against his father while he was drunk, engaged in maternal incest with his mother, Noah's wife, while Noah was drunk, or violated the sanctity of a religious festival by wrongly attributing to his father's shame due to his drunkenness. According to the Book of Jubilees, a set of extra-biblical non-canonical Jewish texts, Noah was not in the wrong for having wine since he was drinking in celebration of a religious tradition. There is no need to explain the flaws inherent in the previous ideas. In Dr. John Henry Clark's book, 
Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism, the writer of the introduction references renowned African studies scholar and researcher Dr. Ben Yokanen's statement, Religion is the deification of a people's culture. In modern times, the Judeo-Christian worldview certainly has been deified and praised as a premier civilizing force. The introduction's writer expands Dr. Ben Yochanan's idea when he writes, Religion is also the deification of a people's politics and power intent. Peterson and others would do well to come to terms with the reality that European politics and power intent, for better or worse, has entrenched itself deeply and quite religiously within the modern world. Although Peterson makes plenty of scholarly omissions, he does speak to a luminary and liberating force present within all human beings. I can appreciate this. I believe wholeheartedly after reading his work that he is sincere in his desire for each human being on the planet to honor their own being as the first step towards the liberation of all people. Honor of the self is perhaps the highest form of self-love. When we honor ourselves, we are likely to honor the best in others. I found his book to be especially powerful considering the times we find ourselves in today. If one recalls, Jordan came to prominence as an opponent of compelled speech when he took on the Canadian Senate's proposal and sponsorship of Bill C-16, a bill which would have required by law Canadian citizens to address members of the LGBTQ community with specialized language. When I looked on the website, I thought, well, there's broader issues at stake here, and I tried to outline some of those broader issues in the initial, you may or may not know, I made some videos criticizing Bill C-16 and it's and a number of its uh, of the policies that surrounding it and I think the most egregious elements of the policies are that it requires compelled speech the uh, the Ontario Human Rights Commission explicitly states that refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name and proper personal pronoun which is the pronouns that I was objecting to uh, can be can be interpreted as harassment and so that's an exp that's explicitly defined in the relevant policies um, so I think that's appalling first of all because there hasn't been a piece of legislation that requires Canadians to utter a particular form of address that has particular ideological implications before and I think that it's a line that we shouldn't cross because of his outspoken resistance to legally compelling humans to use certain speech, he was labeled, quite ironically, by the left as an insensitive, non-progressive conservative, something akin to Donald Trump. Jordan Peterson may be many things, but I certainly have not found his political arguments to indicate that he is in agreement with Trumpian rhetoric or Trumpian philosophical dictates, largely because Trump has never shown himself to be the best orator. Neither has he shown himself to be in any meaningful way philosophical, at least not intentionally so. <laughs> I've heard Peterson roughly acknowledge that Trump does not portray weakness and that this is why he was able to obtain power in the U.S. I've also heard him roughly articulate that Trump's inability to accept defeat is problematic because strong men acknowledge defeat and continue to do good work i.e. aim for the good of all. Peterson has expressed that to the degree Trump refuses to accept his own political mortality, he does himself and the world a grave injustice. I would be inclined to agree with that. Twelve Rules for Life, then, is Peterson's second work. His first was Maps of Meaning, and speaks to the innate character of strength and resilience present in all humans. He is fatherly in his approach to offering all of us the key to our own salvation, a key which is already present inside of us. This is the simplistic brilliance that makes his writing and thinking so attractive. He doesn't give you vague commands and foreign axioms that require decades and scores of practice to implement. Instead, he gives you a distilled version of the truth. The essence of what we intuitively know will make our lives better. I foresee myself returning to this book many times in the future. In it are practical methods for building, maintaining, and repairing relationships, performing better at your chosen job or craft, raising children, and generally becoming an upstanding human being. For those unable or unwilling to invest in therapy and psychoanalysis under a trained psychologist, this book will serve you well. If only you'll take the time to read it and meditate on the principles and stories therein. I give it my highest regards. Jordan Peterson is a very interesting intellectual I love a lot of his philosophies, and I think that he is uplifting in a lot of ways. However, I do find myself getting very annoyed with some of his ideas regarding human development, progress, and what it takes to elevate oneself to the next level. This is the age-old debate between conservatism and liberalism, at least in the American sense. I find that his idea on IQ and race can be a bit problematic because the reason that, for instance, black people in this country 
have experienced so much of the turmoil that they've experienced has less to do with IQ than it does with the socioeconomic conditions that black people have been relegated to since the advent of slavery. And you can't just simply ignore redlining, you can't simply ignore Jim Crow, you can't simply ignore poor schools, poor funding, you can't ignore mass incarceration, you can't just attribute the decline of African American culture in this society to fatherlessness in homes because you have to look at what created fatherlessness in homes. The fact that black people, for instance, are even in this country has more to do with the slave trade than it has to do with black people voluntarily coming over on their own. I think he is an advocate of the idea that other cultures manage to do well because of the way that they think. And I feel that that can be problematic because when we talk about other cultures like Chinese or Irish or Hispanic or whoever that make it over here as immigrants and manage to take advantage of the American economic system, I think you can't really compare those people and their experiences to the experiences of African Americans here because if you start, as the analogy goes, way behind the start line, then you have to first to catch up to get to the start line. And then you have to try to run a race with all the obstacles against you. And his idea is that people who start at a disadvantage have to work harder. And so they'll have more of a story when it comes to their success. But when you are simply trying to survive, you have to overcome all of these obstacles and you're being criticized at the same time for being mentally inadequate and having a low IQ and not being able to keep up with your fellow men, that's not positive and it's not encouraging and uplifting and that doesn't create a support system, a foundation for upward mobility that people in those situations need. I would like to see Jordan Peterson be more understanding of the plight of African Americans and not simply look at the criminalization element and say that, oh, this is just who these people are. We have to look at, and this is why I take him to task on understanding the connection between African Americans here and African people in general from the African diaspora. You have to look at the history and the culture and the connection, the richness of ideas and the fact that Greek philosophers went to study in Africa shows you the tradition of brilliance, of genius. It's difficult for a lot of black people to trace their lineage back to Africa because of the slave trade, but I believe that there is some science that talks about, or some anthropology that talks about how Africans were trading and coming to the Americas long before the slave trade, long before Columbus. The history that we know and that we discuss is, it has to do with the transatlantic slave trade. If there's no connection to one's culture prior to the transatlantic slave trade, then of course there are going to be disconnects in understanding how black people and African people have contributed to the positive development of mankind. If the average kid in the inner city can't see their connection to greatness, their heritage, they may not know that thousands and thousands of years ago they come from a line of maybe pharaohs or a line of kings or a line of certain artisanal masters. Instead, they may present themselves as not being very intelligent, but it's only because, for instance, they may not know from whence they come. And that's very important. And we have to talk about how that can affect an entire generation. Anyway, thank you for listening. As always, you can check out this article, the basic version of it on my Substack and on my Medium page. I will see you next time. Peace.